Welcome to Zoe Science and Nutrition, where world-leading scientists explain how their research can improve your health. What if I told you there's a condition leading to increased risk of heart disease, dementia and early death that's affected humans for as long as we have existed? The host of symptoms can be very unpleasant, ranging from headaches and memory problems to anxiety and weight gain. Then, what if I told you over half the world's population will suffer from this at some point? You might assume this condition would be a constant topic of conversation, studied by many of the world's leading scientists and taught in schools. You would be wrong. The condition I'm talking about is menopause, and it affects 1.2 billion women worldwide. It's not a disease, but its impact can be profound. In today's episode, I'm joined by the British doctor leading a worldwide mission to educate us about menopause and make it a mainstream topic of conversation. Dr. Louise Newsom helps us understand how menopause can affect women and the options available to help. Louise, thank you for joining me today on a topic that is so important and so under-discussed. And I have a whole bunch of questions from our members today, but I think we should start right at the beginning with like a very simple question. What is menopause? And also, why is this a topic which is so sort of personally important to you? Oh, thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me today. So the first question first, I suppose, menopause is just a word and it shouldn't actually be called that. It should be called a female hormone deficiency. Um, and I'd love to change the terminology, but we are where we are. Menopause just means, well, meno is the menstrual cycle, pause is stop. So it's a weird one actually in medicine because it's a retrospective look back in time diagnosis for most of us because it means a year without our periods. That's all it means. Um, and so most women, what happens is we're born with a finite number of eggs in our ovaries. That number um, or the eggs run out eventually, uh, the average age, not that any woman's average, but the average age is around 51 in the UK. So because the eggs run out, the hormones associated with the eggs, the hormones produced by the ovaries also run out. And so they decline and hence the term female hormone deficiency. Um, but it doesn't just happen overnight. It happens gradually for most women. And so a lot of women become perimenopausal before they become menopausal. And peri is just a medical term for around the time of. So often for many years, sometimes even a decade or so, women's hormone levels will be declining at a, at a slowish rate, sometimes a haphazard rate. So they go up and down um, for many years. And so that means they get symptoms, so menopausal symptoms as well, but they won't know that they are because they're still having periods. Um, and the periods can sometimes change in nature or frequency. But also there's a lot of women who never have periods because they might have had a hysterectomy or they might be using some birth control or um, have a contraceptive device, um, a, a, a coil. So they're not having periods. So then they're just getting symptoms. Um, and so with the menopause and perimenopause, there are lots of symptoms because especially uh, the main hormone estrogen, we have cells that respond all over our bodies. Every single cell in our body responds to estrogen. So that means every single system in our body can respond to low estrogen. So symptoms can really vary and they can range from symptoms such as headaches, memory problems, fatigue, reduced stamina, brain fog, low mood, anxiety, dry eyes, dry mouth, painful mouth, tinnitus, hearing problems, palpitations, muscle and joint pains, even stomach problems such as irritable bowel syndrome, digestive problems, um, urinary symptoms, vaginal dryness. The list goes on and on and on because it affects us, um, this lack of hormones. But more interestingly, actually, for me as a physician, of course, I worry about people suffering, but it's looking at future disease. And we know that women who have low hormones, such as menopausal women, have an increased risk of heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, dementia, various cancers, and early death as well. So it's quite doom and gloom being a menopausal woman. I was going to say, you're, you're, I have to say, I'm listening to this, and it's not very cheerful, uh, is it? It's absolutely not. So not only are women suffering emotionally, physically, um, with their partners, with their jobs, everything else, they know that they've got this increased risk of diseases. So it is doom and gloom. It's a natural process for most people. So a lot of people think, well, there's no treatment for natural processes. 
But actually, it's not natural because evolutionary, we're designed to reproduce and then fade away, actually. Um, and so um, the most important treatment for hormone deficiency is having hormones back. And we'll talk about this in a bit, I'm sure, but a lot of people have been very scared about our own hormones. But I've said the average age is 51. We also know that around one in a 100, probably more women, under the age of 40 have an early menopause. And sometimes that is again natural, it's just they've got less eggs and they run out a bit earlier. Or some women have their ovaries removed from surgery or they have it damaged, their ovaries damaged by drugs such as chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Um, so there's a lot of women out there who will be young. My youngest patient was 14 when she became menopausal. And so these women often become perimenopausal before. So there's teenagers who are perimenopausal. There's women in their 20s and 30s. And in their 40s, they'll usually either be perimenopausal or menopausal. So I'm very interested in health. I'm very interested in disease prevention. I'm not a gynecologist. I have a background of hospital medicine. So I actually wanted to do cancer medicine many years ago. And then I got married and thought, how can I be a full-time physician and be a mother of children and be married to a surgeon? So I went part-time and um, became a GP. And then I've done a lot of medical writing, a lot of academia, a lot of evidence-based medicine. I've got a degree also in um, immunology and pathology. So I'm very interested in geeky science as well. We, we like we like that on this podcast. Yeah, so that's good. good. <laughs> good. So I, I've sort of, um, sort of carved this niche really that I've managed to have time to think, which is quite unusual in medicine. And I've also had time to explore my interests. And I've also had time as a GP to listen to patients, which, you know, number one in my career, even now, are my patients. They are the most important, well, actually my family are the most important thing, but second to that are my patients actually, because they have come to ask for professional advice, but they don't want me to be dictatorial. They want to share their decision-making. I want to explore their concerns, their worries, their beliefs, their expectations um, in a two-way process. and. GP gives you great training for that. Or well, I was very, very blessed. I had an amazing trainer called John Sanders who really helped me learn about the consultation process. Um, and so menopause ticks all these boxes of all my areas of interest, actually. So I actually have the best job in the world. It's frustrating because I listen to stories all the time of women suffering, and that's what I'm determined to change. And can you talk a bit about this sort of the scale of the of the problem because I think you already touched a bit on maybe some of the controversies around hormone but, but help to obviously we'll have a lot of listeners who are going through this many who feel that this is coming up for them and many who like me are not going to experience this but of course their their you know their mothers have their their partners will their daughters will talk a bit about this across you know the US and the UK yeah the scale is phenomenal 100% of 51% of the population will become menopausal so it, it, you look at the figures and it's 1.2 billion menopausal women in the world. There's no other condition that is guaranteed to affect us. And when I say condition, people might say, well, it's a natural process, it's not a disease. Well, we can argue about that because there are health risks that I've already said. The same way, is obesity a disease or not? And again, we can argue about that. And I think a lot of people will say there are health risks associated with obesity. Is raised blood pressure a disease? Not really because it doesn't cause symptoms, but we treat it because it's a, a marker of future disease. And menopause is the same, but for many years, we think about menopause as a transition. It's just gonna last a few years. We also think about it just causing a few hot flushes. And a lot of people think, well, my mother's got through it. I'm going to get through it. And when we talk about getting through it, that's about getting through symptoms. And for some women, they might not have any symptoms. We don't know the proportion, it's probably about 20%, might not have many symptoms or any symptoms. We know 25%, so one in four women have severe symptoms. That means it's affecting them at work and at home. But also, whether a woman has symptoms or not, she has this hormone deficiency. So she has this increased risk of disease. So you only need to look at figures for osteoporosis. One in two women over the age of 50 who don't take HRT will develop osteoporosis. One in three will have an osteoporotic hip fracture. 
Our risk of a heart attack increases by a factor of five after the menopause. Who's more likely to get dementia? It's, it's women, it's not men. You know, so it's all there. We know it's there um, and no one's really looking at it because everyone's scared of hormones. But, you know, these health risks are there forever. And then you look at some of the other symptoms. So vaginal dryness, I'm sorry to talk about vagina so early in a podcast, but vaginal dryness is very common. It affects about 80% of women who are menopausal. Yet studies show about 8% of women receive treatment. Now, because all the tissues everywhere in our body responds to estrogen, the tissues lining the vagina, the vulva, even the urinary system respond to estrogen. So without it, these tissues can become very thin, very friable, not stretchy. You can imagine it causes pain and discomfort, but not just with penetrative sex, actually. A lot of women I see can't sit down for long periods of time. Some of them stop wearing underclothes because that friction is really painful. A lot of women experience recurrent urinary tract infections, some urinary incontinence. Um, and this really is affecting the quality of life. But the minority of women are getting treatment, which is just some replacement estrogen in those tissues. And so the scale is huge. You only need to think about how this is affecting women in different cultures. You know, if women are incontinent in Africa, they're ostracized from their community. They can't work. Well, that's awful in 2022, you know. And then we've done some studies. We recently did a study of nearly 4,000 women. And we found that 50% of women answering had either given up their jobs or not taken a promotion at work as a direct consequence of their menopausal symptoms, mainly fatigue, memory problems um, and anxiety. So this is awful, actually. So this is where the scale is mind blowing, actually. And the work I'm doing, there's so much because I'm on a real mission to improve the future health of women, not just in the UK, but worldwide. So we have to do it in a grown up way and we have to empower women, but we also have to give healthcare professionals the tools and knowledge and evidence to support them helping these poor women. And can we talk a little bit about that? So Louise, I know you were telling me just before we started, I think that you're seeing something amazing, like 4,000 women um, a month, I think you said, uh, just in the clinics that you've set up. And that's obviously here in the UK. Um, uh, can we talk a bit more broadly? I think you've already touched a little bit on this this topic about hormones and hormone replacement. Um, you know, what is the situation? You know, in the UK, in the US today, what is the science? You know, what's the latest scientific uh, evidence, um, and what's actually going on, and what do you think should be going on? Yeah. So, it, I mean, it's it's a huge problem because women aren't able to access the treatment. And so I set up a clinic three years ago, really to get some of my friends off antidepressants because antidepressants is not a treatment for the low mood associated with the perimenopause or menopause. And, you know, the, the demand has increased exponentially, but people shouldn't be coming to my clinic. They should be getting it from their local healthcare provider. In the UK, around 14% of menopausal women receive HRT. In the USA, some figures are about 4%. We're one of the best countries, yet we have... And, and Louise, just, just to explain for a bit, H what exactly is HRT? So HRT is hormone replacement therapy, which is what we call it in the UK. In other countries, it's MHT, so menopausal hormonal treatment. It is just hormones, and I'll talk about it, what it is in a, in a few minutes. But... We have um, really good guidelines. So in the UK, we've got NICE, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence Guidelines, came out in 2015. Um, internationally, we've got the International Menopause Society Guidelines that came out in 2016. They're very similar. And actually what they do show is the huge benefits of taking HRT, not just to women's symptoms, but to their future health, especially for osteoporosis prevention. So we have these great guidelines that as clinicians we should be working out of whichever country we're in but we're not are we because the minority of women are able to access it and this isn't because the minority of women want their hormones back it's because they're struggling to get them and so um, we need to think about why why are people so scared about their own hormones and that's because um, if we look back in time in 2002 there was a massive it was a billion dollar study. So 20 years ago, I mean, it's now a lot of money, isn't it, to spend on research a billion dollars, but then- I, I think even today, that's a lot of money, yes. <laughs> massive amounts of money. 
And it was looking at how the future health benefits of HR or, or hormonal therapy um, will help women, but it was actually not a great study in the way it was set up. So, and this is really important to understand. What they were doing was giving um, hormones to, to women, but the average age of women where they were starting MHT or HRT, depending on which country you're in, um, women who were in who were 64 was their average age. A lot of these women were obese and they had heart disease already. And so if you give them HRT or hormones the way that they gave it, they gave tablet estrogen, which we know has a risk of clot, and they gave a synthetic progestogen. So it's a, it's a modified progesterone, and that has effects negatively on the heart system, on clots as well. Gave them these women quite high doses. So women in their 60s who had become menopausal maybe 14 years ago, gave it to them and then they found that there was a small increased risk of heart attack in these women, not surprisingly because we know about how these, these, these hormones worked, but also they weren't really getting very good results and they were spending a lot of money. So what they did find that there was a little bit of an increase in breast cancer with women who took combination HRT. They hadn't analyzed the data properly and what happened was some of the investigators just went to the New England Medical Journal they went to the lay press and said, HRT causes breast cancer. You can imagine, it went wild. And some of the investigators, such as Robert Langer, who's very outspoken about this, said, I went to the chief scientific officer and said, you cannot do this. This is going to be the biggest travesty to women's health for decades. And they said, it's too late, it's gone to press. And isn't that awful? And now we've got 20 years data from this study. We have seen from this study, very eloquently that women who have had a hysterectomy only needed estrogen actually have about a 25% lower risk of developing breast cancer. The ones who were taking this combination estrogen progestogen, there might have been a small increased risk, but it was never found to be statistically significant. And what's very interesting actually is that when they looked at women who had this supposed increased risk, what they were doing was increasing their risk back to baseline in women who had taken HRT before. And women who had taken HRT before were found to have a lower risk of breast cancer. So actually, it's the data's already teasing out that hormones are safe, but the way it was misreported, doesn't matter what the data shows because that's all everyone knows. And we know this is always the danger of taking, you know, very complex science, and 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 the press wants to jump away with a with a very simple because they want to sell bad news stories, don't they? And so we've now got eighteen year follow up studies that came out recently, and they found that women taking any type of HRT have a lower risk of heart disease, osteoporosis, um, diabetes, dementia death and also colon cancer, but also other cancers as well. And women taking any type of HRT are less likely to die from breast cancer. So they might, there might be some women who are, have a higher diagnosis, but they're still less likely to die from it. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm struck again every time you or anyone else talks about this is how little is talked about this. So um, you're talking about, you know, really severe symptoms. I can tell you right now that if men were going through half of those, like we'd all be talking about it all the time. How, um, so not only are you saying that, you, you know, many of them are faced with quite a difficult choice around whether to take these hormones because of, you know, what the people have been talking about in the past and potentially some, some trade-offs. How, how are these women feeling? Uh, you know, how are they supported? How well is this being understood if, um, you know, across the West, you know, I think we talk a little bit more about it than we did, but it still remains something, you know, you talked about my, you know, my mother got through this. I can tell you, like, you know, that generation definitely didn't say anything about it. So, so you know, what's the environment? And I know this is something you care a lot about. Is it changing? I think it is changing, actually. So when I went to my first International Menopause Society meeting, it was in 2016. So the guidelines had just come out for the International Menopause Society. And I was sitting there in the lecture theatre with some amazing academics who I've now got the um, privilege of connecting and knowing. And they were all talking about HRT and saying how safe it is and how great the guidelines are and how amazing all their patients are. And I sat there thinking, what can I do actually? I'm really struck by these stories. And I had just started doing my own clinic. I was just working one day a week 
like I say, seeing some of my friends, some people, and I'd started a website um, to help give people some evidence-based information. And I was quickly seeing stories of women who had given up their jobs, their partners had left them. They were, some of them suicidal and really struggling with no help. So I sat there in this lecture theater thinking, well, what can I do? I can't run a massive research project. I'm just a woman on her own who has just started taking HRT and it's given me my life back. But I couldn't get HRT or menopause or hormonal therapy from my own G GP, my own primary care physician. They said, no, it's too risky, you can't have it. So I had to go and seek it elsewhere. So I'm a white, educated, middle-class woman. I, mean, I just want to stop there for a second because that's an amazing thing for you to say. You said, here are these new guidelines, you know, global guidelines saying this is safe. Uh, could you explain how it was that your own physician is then basically just saying no? Because I'm hearing that and it sounds extraordinary. I know, I know it's shocking, isn't it? And I, I'd look, like to say things have improved, but they haven't. Um, because they, when they were being trained, and most of us don't have formal menopause training, but all they read was, was that hormones are bad and they're going to cause breast cancer. And so, um, and we still see that from our MHRA, our Medicines Health Regulatory Authority are telling us that estrogen is dangerous and it's not. <laughs> um, so, um, so I sat there in this lecture th thinking, what can I do? I can't just have a really big clinic because I'm not business minded. And you've already said, I do now have a big clinic, but it's not enough. It's not enough. And I don't want to be having a clinic empire. So what I've worked really hard the last few years doing is empowering women with knowledge and education because as much as people think women are stupid, we're not, but we have to be given the right tools. And so I started off developing this website, Menopause Doctor, it was called .co.uk. It's now been taken over and it's balance-menopause.com. So I got a lot of, could reach people through a website, but not everyone has the luxury of a computer and internet access. So then I developed the, the free balance app, which has, um, has a lot of information on it. I've also played a lot with social media, mainly just to stalk my children. So a few years ago, I set up Instagram and I've now got, I don't know, 270 something thousand followers. It's just grown organically. And every day when I get up at six in the morning, I just post something. And that's been an amazing platform for people to share knowledge and to learn evidence because so many women and men have been given misinformation about the menopause and especially hormonal treatment. And then that's great. But then what I have found is that more women are understanding that they don't need antidepressants, that their, their fibromyalgia might be due to their um, low hormones or their headaches or their palpitations or their urinary symptoms. But then they're going to their clinicians who are saying, no, like mine did. And so what I set up um, three or four years ago was a not-for-profit company um, called Newson Health Research and Education, and it does what it says. So we launched an education program, which is a um, online program actually i did it online not because of covid i set it up before covid but i was very um just worn out really with going to um lectures where i had to find childcare, pay for it take time out of work so and i also found that i learned the most by sitting in clinics by being with a very esteemed clinicians, asking them questions, seeing how they consult with patients. So we did some videos with some actresses who pretended to be different patients. We also uh, filmed some lectures and we've linked it to evidence um, and also linked it to patient resources. So we've worked with 14 Fish, an appraisal company, and we've got this platform and we've had over 21,000 downloads of this education program over the last six to nine months. But we've made it free because I'm just one. My mission really would be for women to empower themselves wherever they are in the globe, for healthcare professionals to have the right knowledge that is evidence based, and then the dots can be joined, and then I can just go and lie in a dark room. You know, yeah. Your job will be done. It. I feel you'll be campaigning on this topic for for a long time, Louise. So, um, just before we move off this week, one of the questions um, uh, we asked uh, a lot of our members on on social media this week, and there were loads of questions on on this topic. Um, but one of them was, uh, I think, directly into this. You're talking about hormones replacing the natural hormones you have. Uh, but one of the questions was, what's what's the accurate test that can tell me if I'm in perimenopause? Because you describe menopause as, hey, it's a year after this stopped. So that's, 
it's quite a funny sort of diagnosis, isn't it? It's like, wait for a year, it's already happened. Generally in medicine, we like, and I think this is something we believe a lot in Zoe, right? Like sort of preventative health. How do you understand early? So how do our, um, how do our listeners test for themselves and understand where they are in what you described as quite a long sort of slow transition? Do you know what? Wouldn't it be lovely if I could say there was a test and yeah, there isn't. And it's really important to say that there isn't because even in the UK, um, the figures from about four years ago show that 9.2 million pounds is wasted on inappropriate hormone testing. Now, my clinic is private because I can't get a job in the NHS because there aren't enough NHS menopause clinics. If someone gave me 9.2 million pounds, I tell you I could do some really good clinical medicine with that. So um, we know that then the hormone blood tests aren't reliable for a simple fact is that I've already explained when you're perimenopausal, hormone levels really fluctuate. So if I was perimenopausal and I went to my doctor or nurse and had a blood test at three in the afternoon, I probably would feel not so bad and my hormones levels would probably be okay. If at two in the morning I wake up drenched with sweat, having a night sweat, palpitations, intrusive thoughts, crippling anxiety, I can pretty much tell you my blood test will be low. No one's going to take a blood test at two in the morning um, from me. And so that's why they're very unreliable. So there's lots of women who are told it can't be your hormones because your hormone blood test is normal. Well, at that time, you know, it's like looking out the window when it's raining and then 23 hours out of the day, it's sunny. And you say to me, what was the weather like? And I say, it's rainy. I say, don't really Interesting, because we sunny. see exactly the same thing with a lot of our metabolic tests that we do. So, you know, people historically measure all the things like blood sugar and blood fat fasted. Well, it's exactly the same, isn't it? And so, you know, when I was um, a medical student and I did a lot of diabetes work, you know, you would diagnose diabetes, wouldn't you, by fa fasting. Well, sometimes you do a random blood sugar. That's completely useless if someone's just had but Donald's, of course, they're going to have. And so then we did fasting. That was a bit more out there. And then we did the glucose tolerance test. We had to bring people in as an inpatient. Oh, it's just ridiculous. And then HbA1c came out. So this is your average, as you know, average sugar level. Oh, yeah, that was brilliant. That was pivotal, actually. And so what we want to do, what I would love to do is to look at, can we have a test to show? And what we all, everyone's so focused on is, is estrogen being bad and let's delay the menopause, let's delay treatment till people are really bad because estrogen and um, hormones are so dangerous. Well, actually they're not. We know from studies that the earlier women take hormone replacement therapy or menopause or hormone treatment, the better. So let's start it in the perimenopause. Not, let's not wait till these women have given up their jobs and they're really, really struggling. Let's do it early, but how do we find these women? So actually, let's look back into common sense medicine. Let's see what's happening in the body. So rather than relying on symptoms, and I've already said a lot of women don't get symptoms or symptoms that they recognize as, as being related to their low hormones, let's see what's going on. So we know these inflammatory processes start quite early because estrogen works very well on every cell, but especially our, it, it, um, our, our um cells that work for inflammation. So if we think of all those cells, our monocytes, our macrophages, our, all our white cells, they're very good at fighting infection. That's what we need, aren't they? If you have a virus, it will eat them up and, 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 and sometimes develop antibodies. But actually we know, especially macrophages, if they're switched on wrong, they become pro-inflammatory. And if there's pro-inflammatory in the body, inflammation in the body, then it increases risk of disease. We know that for diabetes and heart disease and dementia and osteoporosis. Oh, isn't that a coincidence? All the diseases I've mentioned related to low estrogen. And we've got some really good work, off, some of it's from the 80s, so before the WHI came out, looking how estrogen is an anti-inflammatory. It's an immune modulator. So it's, it, it, genetically reprograms the white cells. It changes the number, it changes the function, it changes the way the cytokines work. It's really powerful actually. And so when they, in the perimenopause, these hormone levels start reducing, these pro-inflammatory effects start working. So what we need to do, I think, is develop a test where we're looking at this biological aging, so not just aging with a bit of gray hair, actually internal aging of the body, this inflammation that goes on. And this is some of the work that 
we're starting to do and starting to get some results actually because I know myself in that you know you start to feel a bit rubbish but you've got like I've got three children I was setting up my website I was opening my clinic of course I'm going to be tired of course I'm going to be right, so you're saying it's hard forgetting to, things hard so to tell whether these know? symptoms yeah, yeah, yeah. are related to menopause or whether they're related to the fact this is tending to hit you in your 40s which is we all know even for men right a particularly tough time with aging parents often children work all these things together Absolutely. And so most women, even those women who say they have no symptoms, um, once they start on some HRT or MHT, then they come back and go, wow, God, this is the best I felt for ages. And I know personally, I had my third daughter when I was 40. I started HRT when I was 45. I felt after a couple of years when I got the right dose and type, I felt the best I felt for about 10 years. So I wish I'd started it earlier. But of course, I didn't know, did I? I just thought it was having the third child that broken the back of me. So actually, if I had done some biological thing, because I started to notice that I was putting on a bit of weight in the midline and I've always been quite slim. And I, I but I couldn't be bothered to do yoga. I just, everything was an effort. And I knew I wasn't sleeping well and poor sleep, we know increased weight. So I still didn't pick up these subtle signs really. Whereas if I had been doing a test, like, um, you know, looking at inflammation and then or my biological age, and it had been the same for the last three or four years, and then suddenly it jumped up, that would be a warning sign. And it might not be diagnosing perimenopause or menopause, but it would be a wake up call. It's a bit like doing your blood pressure, isn't it? Every time you go to the, to the doctor or to a clinic, suddenly it goes up, you think, right, well, what can I do? I don't want to take drugs. I want to think about, is it my lifestyle? Is it because I've started smoking or drinking or not exercising? And that's what we do with blood pressure. That's what we do with, even with diabetes, type two diabetes, we'll think about lifestyle. Well, actually with perimenopause, we, of course we have to think about lifestyle, but we also have to think about our hormones as well. But we need this biological uh, sort of marker. And that's what I think would be really interesting. And then it helps with my whole thing about thinking of, it, the menopause is a female hormone deficiency with health risks, not about, oh, let's just stop this poor lady having 20 hot flushes and just, you know, make her feel a bit more comfortable giving her a fan. Let's work out what's going on biologically in the body and help prevent disease. That's, um, I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, part of the reason that we first got to meet you, Louise, right? We suddenly woke up and uh, Sarah Berry, our, our chief scientist, sort of realized we've actually got the the biggest in-depth study of new nutrition and menopause uh, in uh, in the world with all of this information about the microbiome and metabolic responses. And, and actually, this has hardly been studied, shockingly, you know, that already that first study with a thousand people was like 10 times larger than anything that we had done, um, that anyone had done. Uh, and now we are, you know, sort of 20 times bigger than that. And I think what's really interesting is that we we see in this first paper that you're, uh, you're an author on that will be coming out shortly, like these profound changes changes in um, biological responses uh, in the period around menopause, some of which we see very much, you know, just within the uh, sort of the, the 12 months around menopause, right? But also we also see these big changes in maybe sort of the five years on either side. And so I think what we, you know, people have said a lot, right, which is I feel like my body has changed, like you can measure this, right? We can see that your blood sugar suddenly is completely different in terms of your responses to food, that your blood fat is suddenly completely different, that your inflammatory markers are up. And interestingly, that your microbiome, right, these gut bacteria, uh, we're also seeing these big changes. And uh, I think, you know, we are early in this journey of understanding how to um, uh, piece all of that together. But we can already see, and I guess this is a, a, a way to talk a bit about nutrition, which is something we always like to talk about here, um, that if your responses are changing dramatically, then clearly um, how you should be thinking about what you should eat has also got to change. So, so maybe on that topic, Louise, you know, we talked a lot about hormones, but I know the other question for, for listeners, and I think maybe to talk about food and others, is what else can you do? You have these symptoms, you can take these hormones. What else can you do when you're going through this really sort of profound um, physiological changes? Yeah, it's really important. So whether someone takes hormone replacement or not, they still have to think about their food. Um, and But there's also a lot of talk out there that you can help your menopause or you can get through the menopause with a certain diet, a certain supplement, a certain this. 
phytoestrogens always come up because they contain some estrogen. Do you know what? You'd have to eat so much to stimulate your estrogen receptors properly. And so um, any any supplements that are labeled menopause, I would just put in the bin or I wouldn't even buy, waste my money on them actually, or any sort of specific foods. You have to think about what you're doing. And I think, yes, there are some some work to show that not eating processed foods, not eating spicy foods, not drinking alcohol, reducing caffeine can improve symptoms. But I've already said the menopause is not just about symptoms. So we're kidding ourselves as women if we think that our future health is going to really make a big difference if it's just about diet. But absolutely, you know, I've already said I take MHT or HRT, but what would be the point of me eating McDonald's and smoking 20 a day? It, it would just be stupid, wouldn't it? So we have to take responsibility for what we eat as well. Um, but I say it with a bit of caution because I also know when women have low estradiol levels, they often get sugar cravings. They often comfort eat because they're feeling bad as well. And their met- metabolic processes, again, we haven't got good studies about this, but slow down. So they're going to put on weight more easily. We also know that fat cells, our adipocytes, produce quite a toxic type of estrogen, actually. It's a pro-inflammatory estrogen, but that's all the body's got if it needs estrogen. So people will lay down more fat and increase their weight without changing their their lifestyle, especially in the midline, because their body's saying, give me some estrogen. And so these poor women then often feel like failures and they're feeling bad anyway because of the psychological impact of their low hormones. So it's this downward spiral for a lot of people. And a lot of women listening might acknowledge that even if they're getting regular periods, because we've most women experience some sort of dip in their hormones just before their periods. And that's often when they're craving sweets or sugars or whatever. Um, but it's only a day or two a month, so people often just ignore those signals from their brain or succumb, but it's only a short term. But that all the time is really having an effect. Um, so it, it's difficult, actually, but I it's certainly um, most women can take HRT. We're just writing up a, uh, some, some work, actually, for the Cancer Journal, which will be out soon. And um, I've written about vaginal estrogen. You know, I've already said for vaginal dryness how safe it is for women who've had breast cancer. And Avram Blooming, an oncologist in America, is writing, um, looking at a review of studies of giving um, hormones to women who've had breast cancer. And 24 out of 25 studies have not shown a detrimental effect. So this is going to be really important. So I would hate people here listening to think, but that's fine, but I can't take HRT or MHT. Most people can. But um, we need to obviously look at look at diet as well. And if women are not able to receive the right treatment or they're struggling to see the right clinician, then they should be looking at diet. And you're absolutely right thinking about insulin. It's really evil, actually, if we get too many peaks. And so looking at the sort of processed food, those fast food, those sugar hits, is actually really bad for us in our system metabolically as well. And if we've got a metabolic insult, i.e. the perimenopause or menopause, don't throw more metabolic insults at your body. So looking at foods, looking at the glycemic index of foods, looking at the whole range of foods so that we're really feeding our gut microbes as well and um, adding things to our diet, even if it's just adding a handful of seeds to a salad or trying a new vegetable that's hopefully in season, that's going to be really good for your gut health as well. And so the last thing I would want, and I see it a lot, is that women restrict their diets because they're so scared of putting on weight. So they come and say to me, oh, Dr. Newton, I'm putting on weight, but I'm now not having breakfast. I'm just having a cheese sandwich at lunchtime and I'm having a low fat something given up rubbish. gluten and i've yeah. given up lactose yeah and I've precisely given up all and i don't have any fat in my diet no fa- yeah. so their brain fog's even worse than ever and so it's like no you've got to feed these microbes and we work with emma ellis flint who's an amazing nutritionist and a chef and she's she's one of our balance gurus and if any of you watch the way she cooks it's so exciting you can smell that food coming from the video you know she And food, we all need to eat, don't we? We can choose whether we drink alcohol or exercise or smoke, but we have to eat, but it should be a real pleasure. I love my food, Um, but I 
really careful about what I eat. And I know that if I just went off now and had a packet of crisps and a, a Mars bar, for, firstly, I'll get a migraine, so I can't do it because I can't function without a migraine. But secondly, I might feel fine for 10 minutes when my sugar level changes and my insulin or, and then suddenly I will just burn. And that's what's happening all the time. We're giving ourselves these insults. We're, we're you know, we're having these juices or these low, fat, sugar drinks or whatever. And it's it's a car crash, isn't it? For our gut microbes and metabolically. Right, and I think what what is interesting, I think what is new with some of the um, the research that, um, that we've been working on and that Zoe's been published otherwise is is the way in which we see these profound changes in people's responses to food, you know, as they age. And so I think what is really interesting, um, we see these huge personal variations, um, but we can also talk about, you know, in general differences between men and women, because there are big average differences. And I think one of the things that's really striking is that uh, on average, women in their 20s and 30s are able to uh, eat much larger um, quantities of food that's high in fat or high in sugar before having these inflammatory responses on average. And we see these huge variations. And then what we see in this this paper that's been coming out, out shortly that you were, were involved in, right, is this profound change sort of during your 40s, where at the start of this, you know, you've probably had this food that you've been eating for 20 years and it's been causing no problem. And absolutely, you haven't put on any weight and you feel good. And then suddenly you're 50 and you look at it and you say, well, yeah, I'm not surprised that you're now having problems because if you look at the amount of uh, blood sugar impact that's happening, if you look at the amount of blood fat, well, now you're not managing to clear that, right? It's still there after six hours. You're having these inflammatory responses. And so this idea that your body has changed, you know, it's not just in your mind, it's it's real. Um, and I think the, you know, the positive news is that you... It doesn't mean there's nothing you could do about it, but it does mean that probably, in a sense, you've you've sort of been able to get away potentially with eating these foods. It was fine, and now there are some things that doesn't mean you can never eat them. But you've got to think more about well, if these are treats, how do I sort of feed myself around it, and how do I support those those gut microbes, right, to try and um, you know generally reduce this this inflammation. I think that's really exciting, and one of the things that um, you know we're looking to. To, to get much deeper into with you and some of these other experts on, on menopause. Now, it's very interesting. I mean, I've talked a lot about estrogen, but also, I don't know if you know this, Jonathan, but women produce three times more testosterone than estrogen. And so testosterone is a female hormone as well as a male hormone. It's produced by the ovaries. Whether it's a menopause decline or an age decline, there's a bit of a debate, but it doesn't matter. It gets lower as we get older. And so testosterone, again, we have receptors all over our bodies, in our brains. So women who often have low testosterone often find they have brain fog, they have memory problems, they have reduced stamina. It's also very important for muscle. So muscle mass can reduce. Um, and because of stamina and muscle mass reducing, that can be a real problem with exercise. But we do see a lot of women who, once they start estrogen, especially when it's given through the skin as a patch gel or spray, their weight starts to reduce, this midline spread reduces. And then when they have testosterone, their weight or their body shape rather than their actual weight changes as well. Um, and whether that's because they're exercising easier and better and more effectively, I think that is partly to play, but I think also there's metabolic changes. We don't know enough about testosterone in women. There is research testosterone in men, but obviously they have higher doses. What I'd love to do is more research on that. And we have a DEXA scan here in the clinic looking at bone density, but it also can do body composition. And so I'm really, really interested in looking at visceral fat and how that changes with estrogen and testosterone, because I think if we got some good studies, we would show that both those hormones, probably independently, have an effect on our visceral fat, which, as you know, is a marker for cardiovascular disease. And we actually had a lot of questions around body shape change. So, and what you're saying is, this is real. This isn't just something that this is a uh... yes. You know, it's real, but but there isn't any evidence. So there's a lot of those people who only believe in randomized controlled studies say, but there's no evidence. Well, actually, you know, I've seen thousands of women. And so I have some real lived in experience actually of this. And you have to learn from patients. You know, it's very good. We have to have evidence as well. We have to have studies. But if we only looked at randomized controlled studies, we wouldn't have penicillin, would we? <laughs> And also you have to do the studies, right, Louise? I mean, I think one of the things that's really striking is 
how little science has been done on women uh, as compared to men. It's one of the things that's, I think, really been shocking for me as I've, I've got into this over the last five years. If I try and play back a little bit of what we've just covered today, I think we started by saying um, that menopause is actually interestingly defined as something that stopped 12 months earlier. And actually, if we really want to understand what's going on, we have to think about this perimenopause, which is very variable between women, that there is no test that allows you to understand that you're already in this. And so a single hormone test, for example, you know, if it said that your hormones are fine, you're, you're dubious because it could well be that it's just the point in, in the day and that we need to develop um, better test, tests to understand this. Um, that hormones replacement uh, is now um, viewed through global guidelines as well as the guidelines you described in in the UK as a uh, uh, as the right um, solution for many women that there's been a lot of debate about this impact particularly to do with breast cancer um, and that your your strong view is that when you look against the balance of all the benefits that um, uh, that you get including things that are affecting health um, and and death rates as well as just your you know the quality of life uh, you are a strong campaigner uh, for the ability to take these hormones that as you as you say all women have in their bodies all the time until this um, in this point and that this is sort of sort of transformational and that there's shockingly low levels of this you you describe even between the US and the UK right I think you said between four and fourteen percent is that right so that itself is interesting right that you could have two countries with very shared views about the health system and such big variation. Uh, and then I think we talked a bit about nutrition and the way that this does not um, replace this question around um, hormone replacement, but is incredibly important uh, in addition. And the way we there is these sort of profound changes in the way that women's bodies metabolize food through this period. And so it is true that, you know, your body is different from before. Some of these things, people are feeling like body shape changes are real um, and that therefore understanding like what's right to eat now, which is different from before, um, is important. And then I think we just wrapped up by saying it's sort of amazing how little this has been studied, um, how much opportunity there is, therefore, to understand all of this uh, better. And, um, you know, I know I speak on the on the Zoe side, this has become one of the things we're most interested in because it's just such an enormous impact on um, on our members. And, and there's been so little investigation. So, uh, we hope to have you back again in in the future and to talk about some of the uh, the further studies and the guidance that that comes out of this. I'll be delighted. Thanks ever so much for inviting me today. It was a real pleasure, Louise. Thank you so much. I think that it's uh, it's really amazing to hear your your sort of personal championing of this. And I, I think for many people listening, whether it's affecting themselves or affecting people um, that they love, I think it's a it's a really powerful message. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you to Dr. Louise Newsom for joining me on Zoe Science and Nutrition. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please be sure to leave us a review and subscribe. If you're interested in learning more about Zoe and the best foods for your body and what to do during menopause, you can head to joinzoe.com slash podcast and get 10% off your personalized nutrition program. Finally, if this episode left you with questions, please contact Zoe on Instagram or Facebook and we will try to answer them in a future episode. As always, I'm your host, Jonathan Wolfe. Zoe Science and Nutrition is produced by Fascinate Productions with support from Sharon Feder here at Zoe. See you next time.